So I saw an eight, I saw nothing, I saw eight again, but because I really didn't know the rules of the pick three lottery because I never played that stupid game, um, um, I, I, it didn't occur to me that the same number could appear twice. And so that's, that's one of the complicating factors is occasionally you do have to interpret the information correctly. So this is a revolutionary tool. Uh, last night people were talking about, you know, we need something practical that can blow people's minds. We need something uh, that, that, that really can transform mindsets. So this is why I think it's a revolutionary tool. The, the main problem with precognitive dreams, normal precognitive dreams, is the person brings it up after the fact, and then the scientist says, well, this is all retrocognitive, this is just something that occurred, and, and these just don't have any connection. But, but imagine this. You're a lucid dreamer, and you establish the task with a scientist, whatever that precognitive task is. Then you become consciously aware in a dream, you obtain the information, you wake with it, you give it to the scientist, then you and the scientist both wait for the results to occur. I mean, that's how simple this kind of tool can be to show that uh, time and space are really much different than people conventionally think it is. These are some of the practical considerations, though. Uh, first, the memory recall issue. Just like my friend with a powerful number, you, you got to keep it pretty simple. You can't have somebody memorize a whole giant thing and then take it from the lucid state into the waking state. That's just too difficult. Also, you got to avoid complicated um, scientific experiments because when you're lucidly aware, you're trying to maintain that lucid environment, keep it stable, and if it's too complicated, you just get caught up in too many uh, uh, things. Now, one issue is, though, the lucid dreamer's level of belief or disbelief. If you have conceptual disbelief, like remember the kid who went to find the bizarre freckle? The first time he does it, all these people start appearing as he's going down the hallway to the women, uh, woman's place and yelling at him, this, is, this isn't a dream, this is real. And, and he gets into this whole thing. You, can, you kind of see his disbelief or his concern symbolically expressed. And, and so you have to find lucid dreamers who don't have disbelief and they don't have internal conflicts. And, and you can find that by having lucid dreamers who've had experience, successful experiences with this. So also lucid dreaming has become a revolutionary tool for healing self and others. I think my book is the first time that anyone's ever mentioned actual physical healings. So the way it got started, there's a gentleman, uh, Ed Kellogg, has a PhD from Duke in biochemistry. He'd infected his tonsil. He was eating a shish kebab and pierced his tonsil, and it became infected. And, and, and he just hates going to doctors, and he's a great lucid dreamer, so he decided to become consciously aware and direct healing intent onto his tonsil. He said he woke up, 95% of the pain was gone, uh, within a few hours, it had shrunk down to its normal size and, and just totally disappeared. There's a young woman in my book, uh, Patricia Keelan, uh, works with Stephen LaBerge, uh, helping him do some of the seminars. She had out of control menstrual bleeding. And the doctor said it was so serious that they were going to have to uh, uh, remove, you know, do a hysterectomy. So she began consciously aware uh, she did some things, but she directed healing intent into her hands and in her dream body inserted her hand into her uterus and directed healing intent there. She woke up, no more out of control bleeding, never returned. Uh, Beverly Kudzerski Dierso, she went to the doctor. She, she was some of the uh, original uh, research work with LaBerge. Uh, she had an expanded uterus with a cyst and mass. Uh, she got very concerned about it. She became consciously aware in the dream state. Uh, first she went to seek information on why she was having this condition, then in the second semi-lucid dream, uh, geometric figures of light shot healing energy on her. She knew she was healed, she went to the doctor that day, he said her, her uterus was no longer expanded and she didn't have anything abnormal there, so there's nothing to be done. So, so and finally, uh, Ed Kellogg, uh, he became consciously aware, he had talked to a gentleman who had severe emphysema if he could practice providing healing energy to him in the lucid dream state. The guy said, yeah, so he got, he got prior consent. He goes to him and basically shoots healing light out of his hands. And that's one of the funny things. A lot of people who do this, they spontaneously find that healing light is shooting out of their hands. Uh, the next day, the guy's emphysema had improved so much that he no longer had to be on oxygen 24 hours a day. He'd just do it at night and that continued for five years. 
So the potential for psychology is to investigate the communications with another layer of our self. And by that I mean, in my book I talk about a counterintuitive technique where instead of dealing with the dream figures and the dream objects and the apparent, I shout out my request to the dream. Instead of dealing with the dream figures, I just yell out to the dream awareness. I say, hey, show me something I should see. Or hey, let's do this or that. Ernest Helgard uh, talked about the hidden observer, which is something that he found in deep hypnosis. And, and I began to wonder, is that what's behind the dream? Is that what awareness is responding to all of my requests? Uh, Morton Prince, a hundred years ago, talked about co-consciousness, that we must have some co-consciousness. Carl Jung would always talk about the self with a capital S. But, but you can encounter this via a counterintuitive technique. Uh, one time I was talking to my niece, and uh, she's 21 years old, asked her about her dream life. Then I asked her about her lucid dream life, and she said, oh, I've had 10 or 15 lucid dreams, but they don't mean anything. <laughs> and so I told her, okay, here's what I want you to do. Next time you become consciously aware, ignore all the dream figures and just shout out to the, to the dream, hey dream, show me something I should see. So she becomes consciously aware a, a, a tiger had been chasing her through Kansas City. Then she realized how stupid that was, and, and she became consciously aware. And all of a sudden, so she remembered my thing, and she goes, shouts out, hey dream, show me something I should see. All of a sudden, she sees this long blue hallway, and at the end of it is a white-haired woman. She walks down there to see who the white-haired woman is, and she realizes it's her great-grandmother, Nunu. And Nunu goes, Jane, you have such great timing. See, Nunu's been dead for about 15 years. And, and, and Nunu says, you can have great timing. She goes, I get out of purgatory tomorrow. So this, so this is just great. <laughs> My, my, my little niece was, was so unchurched, she, she had to ask me, now, now what's this purgatory thing? And I was just like, but, but anyway, so, so as they're going, uh, Nunu tells Jane, she, she has something she wants Jane to tell her mom. She goes, Jane, I want you to tell my mom, your mom to remember the back room in my house. And Jane in the lucid dream goes, what? And, and Nunu goes, just tell her, remember the back room in my house. Jane wakes up, she calls me up, she goes, Uncle Robert, what do I do with this? And I say, here's what you do. You pick up the phone and call your mom. So she calls her mom. Her mom bursts into tears. And after her mom calms down, she realizes, uh, her mom says that in the back room of Nunu's house was a place that all the grandkids could come and dress up and put on parties and things. And Nunu allowed anything to happen. And so in that back room of Nunu's house, Jane's mom said, were the happiest moments of her life. So here's, here's where the real promising potential is. Lucid dreaming is occurring in college age psychology level students uh, very widely. You can see that it's from 47 to 92 percent of the kids say they've had a lucid dream. When you see how many have had frequent lucid dreams, uh, that about drops in half. So, so that's where we begin to realize the potential because this lucid dreaming is a, something we all do, or, or all of us dream, we can all learn how to become consciously aware in the dream state. There's very simple techniques. And through scientific experimentation, we can recognize the larger self. So I'll just leave this quote up by Carl Jung and be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Perfect time. Thank you. This is a woman, Jane Gockenbach, uh, G-A-C-K-E-N-B-A-C-H. And um, she, she has a whole laundry list, so, so I'm not going to go into them now. Um, from her research, uh, women have a better time or an easier time becoming consciously aware than men do. Um, and, and there's various other things. But, but really, you'll, you'll have to ask her or, or check out her research. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I've ever done any studies on sleep apnea uh, 